Good morning. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And I'm glad you came this morning. Are you glad you came this morning? (laughs) Who else here had a crazy week? Raise your hand if you had a crazy week. Maybe you had a crazy Saturday like I did. (laughs) Or Saturday night like I did. But you know what? This world is a crazy place. And we can be crazy in church, but this is a place of peace. I want you to hear that this morning. And just feeling like I'm not kind of alone here and having a crazy week and seeing the world is a crazy place. But this is a place of peace. Right? So that's what we're going to come here and do on Sundays. Find your peace here. Tell a friend. You got a friend who's going crazy with the world. They're disappointed in the world. I got a place you can come and find some peace, right? And then we're going to lead you to Jesus. That's what this is all about. So thank you for coming this morning. I'm going to tell a story now. I heard a story about two brothers. There was an older brother. Clearly, there has to be. Well, they could have been like, nope, you can't do it at the same time. So there's an older brother. (laughs) This is when I off the cuff things. And there's a younger brother. The older brother, very successful. American success story, beautiful house, the white picket fence, beautiful wife, got the kids, 2.5 children, everything's great. Great job making tons of money. The younger brother, not so much. He had a wife and kids and stuff, a house, but he also had a drinking problem. And he also had a gambling problem. So he was always having a tough time with money. They lived in a small town. That doesn't help. Everybody knows his deal. And now he can't find a job. He's really down on his luck. He finally hits a bottom, though, and he decides to go to a neighboring town where they don't know him. And he interviews for a job. And he gets the job. A fresh start. Here's the problem. He gambled away his car. So he couldn't do the commute. Goes to the older brother who's successful and figures, I'll ask him for a loan. Here's the problem. He'd already done that several times and the older brother pointed that out. You already owe me thousands of dollars. I'm not gonna give you more money until you pay the money you owe me back. That's it. But the younger brother says, this is different. I want a fresh start. I'm getting a job somewhere else in another town. Nobody knows me. I'm gonna do it right this time. The older brother says, all right, if you keep the job for a year, I'll forgive all the debt, everything you owe me. I'll forgive it all. Just keep the job for a year. Deal. About a week later, the older brother goes to the younger brother's house to check in on him, just dropping in. It's on a Saturday. He knows he works a nine to five. There might have been motives for dropping in unannounced, but he looks in the driveway. He sees no car. He looks in the garage, no car, but there's a brand new bicycle in the garage. And he thinks he puts two and two together and he says, oh, not again. He squandered the money, bought a bike with the leftovers to get back and forth to work. Fantastic. Younger brother sees him out the window, comes out to greet him. The older brother's like, "Uh uh-uh, no, 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 no. I'm not even talking to you anymore. We're done. You've blown it. I don't want to talk to you again until you've paid back every cent you owe me. Everything. Don't speak to me anymore. The younger brother says, wait, no, 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 no. Let me explain. Nope, I'm not hearing it. Not another word. Gets in his car, drives off. You know what? He never spoke to his younger brother again. In fact, one day he got a phone call many years later. Person let him know, your brother's dead. Didn't surprise him. He had a drinking problem, all these other things going on, of course. He wasn't actually even sad. He said, you know what, I'm not even gonna go to this funeral. Done with this guy, I've been done with this guy. Wife convinces him though, hey look, bring some closure to this. It's also gonna look pretty bad to your family if you don't go to your brother's funeral. So go, fine. So he gets dressed up, goes to the funeral. He's sitting there listening to people talk and then one of those people, is his nephew. 
And so his younger brother's son begins talking. He's an older man now. He's got kids of his own. He's doing all right. Starts talking, and it's surprising to the older brother because he begins to validate, justify some of these resentments that the older brother has. He gets up there, and he's just honest. He says, you know what? Elephant in the room. My dad was an alcoholic. He never really got over it. There are all his drinking buddies right there. You're next, you know? Also, my dad had a gambling problem, so I know I'm not going to get any inheritance because there's going to be a line out the door all you, that he owed money to. The older brother's like, me first. Now, the older brother's like feeling pretty good now. He's like, I'm glad I came to this funeral. I feel justified in all these resentments, and he's kind of happy. Plus, I'm going to get paid. Who goes to a funeral and gets paid? That's kind of nice. But then the younger brother says, there's something weird happened. I still can't figure out. For all my dad's faults, he managed to put me through college. And I could never figure out how he did that. Now, it wasn't Harvard or anything, community college, but still, I have no student loans. I never figured out how he did that with all the troubles he had. Just then, a man sitting next to the older brother childhood friend of theirs leaned over. He says, I know how he paid off the debt. Looked at him, he said, how? Well, he used the money that you gave him for the car to put the kid through college, bought a bike instead to get back and forth to work. You see, assumptions can be a very dangerous thing. Today, we find ourselves in the rest of the story, where we're going to see some people make some assumptions, and it gets them in a lot of trouble. Also, we'll see in the text that there are places where we can be tempted to assume things that we shouldn't. We left off with the death of King Saul. Very tragic life, very tragic death. Now, 2 Samuel 1.1 says this, after the death of Saul, David returned from his victory over the Amalekites and spent two days in Ziklag. On the third day, a man arrived from Saul's army camp. He had torn his clothes and put dirt on his head to show that he was mourning. He fell to the ground before David in deep respect. Where have you come from? David asked. I escaped from the Israelite camp. The man replied. What happened? David demanded. Tell me how the battle went. The man replied, our entire army fled from the battle. Many of the men are dead, and Saul and his son Jonathan are also dead. How do you know Saul and Jonathan are dead? David demanded of the young man. The man answered, I happened to be on Mount Gilboa, and there was Saul leaning on his spear with the enemy chariots and charioteers closing in on him. When, we turned and saw, when he turned and saw me, he cried out to, for me to come to him. How can I help? I asked him. He responded, who are you? I am an Amalekite, I told him. Then he begged me, come over here and put me out of my misery, for I'm in terrible pain and I want to die. So I killed him, the Amalekite told David, for I knew he couldn't live. Then I took his crown and his armband, and I have brought them here to you, my Lord. To David's reaction, he then tears his clothes. He mourns all day for Saul, showing again his character. For all his flaws, right, he honored the Lord's anointed one. As far as the Amalekite is concerned, if you're familiar with the account of Saul's death, you may have raised an eyebrow because the accounts kind of don't really line up too well. One's a sword, the other's a spear, so got a little few details wrong, but we don't know. It's a place where we can make an assumption. Is he lying? Is he just trying to win favor with David? We're not really sure. Whatever the case may be, we do know that he made an assumption that's going to cost him his life. So David says, why weren't you afraid to kill the Lord's anointed one? Remember, David had his chance a couple times, right? He didn't do it, so why did you do it? You have confessed that you killed the Lord's anointed one. And so he has that man killed. Terrible tragedy and irony here that the Amalekite says he's the one who does it. That was one of the major sins of Saul. He didn't finish them off like he should have. Cost him his life. So David composes a funeral song 
for Saul and Jonathan. Remember that David is a psalmist. He's a songwriter. He's a very talented musician. Side note, lots of different books we don't have or are included in the Bible and not. It says that this one is found in the book of Jasher. We don't have it. But if we keep reading what we do have, 2 Samuel 2.1 says this, After this, David asked the Lord, Should I move back to one of the towns of Judah? Yes, the Lord replied. Then David asked, Which town should I go to? To Hebron, the Lord answered. David two, David's two wives were Hinnom from Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal from Carmel. So David and his wives and his men and their families all moved to Judah, and they settled in the villages near Hebron. Then the men of Judah came to David and anointed him king over the people of Judah. Then David hears about the guys who buried Saul, burned Saul's body and buried the bones, if you remember that, the people from Jabesh Gilead. He applauds them for what they did and asks for their loyalty. But if we keep reading, it says this, but Abner, son of Ner, the commander of Saul's army, had already gone to Maenaim with Saul's son Ishbosheth. There he proclaimed Ishbosheth king over Gilead, Jezreel, Ephraim, Benjamin, and the land of the Asherites, and all the rest of Israel. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was 40 years old when he became king, and he ruled from Maenaim for two years. Meanwhile, the people of Judah remained loyal to David. David made Hebron his capital, and he ruled as king of Judah for seven and a half years. Keep your eye out for a couple things here. David's diplomacy. So he's dealing with a split kingdom. And so this is like a precursor to what's going to happen later down the line when then Israel falls and Judah falls. David's going to unify the kingdom, but in these sections, he's making a great effort to do so. So I'll point some of that out to you. Split kingdom, Israel in the north, Judah in the south. David now is king of Judah. Now we have their generals. Ishbosheth has Abner, that's his general. Joab is David's general. And so now they're going to get, go to war with one another. First, we get a scene where Abner is talking to Joab or communicating with him at the pool of Gibeon, and he makes a suggestion, kind of similar to the reasoning behind David and Goliath. Sometimes you'll send one champion out to represent each side. Instead of losing thousands of men, you lose one. In this case, 12 and 12, and they're going to fight one another to kind of decide something, I guess. And it's kind of kind of strange. It seems like a summary of what's going on. It says that they all grab each other's hair and stab each other in the side and kind of like in a synchronized death battle, just all die at the same time. A little strange, probably just a summary of what happened. But because there's no decisive winner, there's now a big battle. And Abner's on the losing side, so he's fleeing away. And now you have Abishai, Asahel, and Joab, the three sons of Zeruiah. You might remember Abishai, he's the guy, remember when they snuck up on Abner and Saul and they had the spear and the water jug? He's the guy who was with David. So you have these three brothers and Asahel is chasing after Abner now. And it says he is as fast as a gazelle. So easy to remember, Asahel is fast as a gazelle. He's running after Abner, but Abner warns him. Got to pay attention. Abner looks back, he says, and he warns him, stop chasing me. Go find one of the like, younger guys and plunder them. Kill them and plunder them. So we get the picture here that Abner's a more experienced, stronger warrior, but maybe he's an older guy like me. So he's running along and he's like, ah, stop it. And he says, I don't want to kill you. How would I ever face your brother again? Warns him and warns him. Kid doesn't listen. He runs and it says that he hits him with the butt end of his spear. It goes through his body and kills him. Well, now Joab and Abishai, they find out. And they're not happy. So they're chasing after him, intending to kill him. And there's one scene where he's getting ready to make his stand on a hill with the Benjamites. And Abner appeals again. He said, must we always be killing one another? Don't you realize that bitterness is the only result? And they actually listen. Joab says, if you hadn't said anything, we would have chased you all night. So they go their separate ways, and it turns out to be way worse for Abner than it is for Joab. Joab only loses 19 men, plus his brother, that's very bad, but Abner loses 360 men, way worse for them. So if we turn the page, 
We see this, 2 Samuel 3.1. That was the beginning of a long war between those who were loyal to Saul and those who were loyal to David. As time passed, David became stronger and stronger while Saul's dynasty became weaker and weaker. If we keep reading, if you're reading along, my friends, you'll see a brief genealogy of David's sons born in Hebron. That's not all of them. But then it says, as the war between the house of Saul and the house of David went on, Abner became a powerful leader among those loyal to Saul. One day, Ishbosheth, Saul's son, so that's the king of Israel, accused Abner of sleeping with one of his father's concubines, a woman named Rizpah, daughter of Aiah. So Abner immediately reacts sharply. What am I, some Judean dog that you'd accuse me of this? Look at all the things that I've done for your family. He's really, really mad. So here's another assumption that we can make, that Abner slept with the concubine. Now, if you don't know, a concubine can be like a second wife. It's probably not the primary wife, but they had polygamy back then. We got to just deal with it and get over it. So it's one of his dad's wives he's being accused of sleeping with. We don't know if he did it or not. It doesn't really say. But here's what we know. He did react sharply and immediately. Keep that in mind. And he takes the opportunity to leave. So he splits from the king of Israel, and he says, I'm going to make David's kingdom great. So this is where Abner plays the role of like an ambassador, is what he's going to do. First, he sends messengers to David. He says, you know, aren't you king of all this land? Aren't you the real king is basically the summary of it. So David kind of likes the idea, sends messengers back, and they make a deal. Here's the deal. I want my wife, Michael, back. Huh? There's another wife. Remember, Michael was left with Saul. That was his daughter. Got left behind with her. And he mentions the bride price he paid. 100 Philistine lives. Well, if you remember, David was an overachiever here. He gave him 200 things from the Philistines as the bride price. He wants her back. So he calls on Ishbosheth, send my wife back to me. And you get this kind of almost comical scene where her husband, because It had told us before, she got married off, even though not divorced from David, Palti, he's kind of pitiful, Palti. He's kind of following behind, crying about his bride as they take Michael off. And Abner just basically says, go home, you know, get out of here. So here's what Abner does. He acts as an ambassador and he gets all the support from David, from the elders of Israel, in particular the tribe of Benjamin. This is important because this is where Saul is from. So the Benjamites are really important here. He's drumming up all this support for him. So what does he do? He finally goes to Hebron. He's 20 men with him. He announces it to David. They celebrate. They have a feast. And then he leaves. Then right after it, Joab comes back from a raiding party. So that's David's general. He finds out about it. He says, what? What were you thinking? He's probably a spy. He's going to come in here and you know, do bad things to us. This is bad news. What would you do? So... He sends messengers for Abner. Because remember, the ex-general of Israel, come on back. Abner comes back. He sees him at the town gate. Now, Abner is none the wiser. He doesn't know. He figures, hey, maybe he wants to talk to me. So Joab comes up to him and stabs him in the stomach, kills him in revenge for the death of his brother. David, remember, diplomacy, he disagrees sharply with this. He has nothing to do with this. In fact, he condemns it and he curses Joab and his brother. May they have family members in the future who have like leprosy, sores, and begging for food and all this horrible stuff. He proclaims curses on him. He mourns. He doesn't eat anything. May the Lord strike me dead if I eat anything today. He's really trying to make an effort to show everybody, not saying that he's not sincere, but he's making a strong effort to show everybody that he's really upset about this. And this pleases the people. He writes another song. This one's for Abner, short one. But remember, diplomacy, very important for David right now. If we turn the page, 2 Samuel 4.1, when Ishbosheth, Saul's son, heard about Abner's death at Hebron, he lost all courage, and all Israel became paralyzed with fear. Now, there were two brothers... 
Bana and Rechab, who were captains of Ishbosheth's raiding parties. They were sons of Rimmon, a member of the tribe of Benjamin who lived in Beeroth. The town of Beeroth is now a part of Benjamin's territory because the original people of Beeroth fled to Gidim, where they are, still live there as foreigners. Now, if you're reading along, you're going to see a little parenthetical note. In a pretty good version of the Bible, I'll put this in parentheses because it's kind of like parentheses. Because parentheses isn't a word. Parentheses. <laughs> because you got to kind of hang on to this for later. <laughs> so it's going to talk about Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. It's fun to say. Say it with me. Mephibosheth. Now you know how to say it. So anyway, remember him. I'm not going to go into the text really, but just keep him in mind. He's Jonathan's son. He's crippled because he gets dropped as a baby. His feet are crippled. But we're going to see more happen there with diplomacy later on, not this week. Now we get back to Rechab and Baina. They think it's a good idea to kill Ishbosheth. So, this is made easy by, their, by Ishbosheth's doorkeeper, who's tired from working. She falls asleep. They sneak past her. He's taking a midday nap. Anybody take a midday nap? Be careful, because someone might come in and kill you and cut your head off. That's what they do. <laughs> they bring it to David, and they say, look, basically, like your enemy's head. Gross. But anyway, David's used to that kind of thing. But here's the thing. Here's how he responds. Someone once told me that Saul was dead, thinking it was good news. But I killed him at Ziklag. Remember the Amalekites? We were coming full circle. It's like the same thing happening. That was his reward for his news. How much more reward for someone who kills an innocent man in his own bed? So he has them killed. They cut off their hands and their feet. They just... Just discard the bodies by a pool in Hebron. And then they take Ish Ishbosheth's head and they put it in Abner's tomb. So again, he's honoring Abner. So, like the Amalekite, these men paid the price for an assumption. Again, assumptions can be a very dangerous thing. How often do we make assumptions? without having all the details. Do we do that? And then let that lead to big mistakes, saying the wrong thing, ruining relationships with people. This happens when we're not careful to get all of the information before making a decision about something. How often do we make assumptions that lead to resentments or lack of forgiveness? Do we do that sometimes? You see, Jesus calls us to reconcile, to move away from these resentments that rot within us. Matthew 18, 15. If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. Go right to them instead of talking to everybody else about it. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. The goal. Okay, if you're marking your Bible, circle that and be like, well, star, the goal. Win the person back. But if you're unsuccessful, take one or two others with you so that you can yell at them. No. <laughs> Read along. <laughs> Go back again. So, so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, Take your case to the church. Go to Pastor Gene's office. Then, if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. All too many people love that last part. See, that's what Jesus said to do. No. <laughs> yes, but not yet. Like, you got a lot of steps first. But that's what too many people do, right? They get a problem with someone in the church or with me or somebody else. And they go and they build a resentment, talk to everybody else about it but that person. They don't have all the details. And they leave. That's more common, but that's not what Jesus says to do. If we keep reading, we see the verses about binding in heaven, binding on earth, loosing in heaven, loosing earth where two or three are gathered in his name, Jesus is there. And then it says this. A lot of people stop there. They shouldn't. Matthew 18, 21. Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? 
Seven times? Gives a little proposal there, right? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. 490? That's a lot. See, Peter is trying to lawyer it. Do we do that? Do we lawyer Jesus' sayings, the scriptures? We stop at a convenient place. But Jesus gives him no out. None. You see, I want to make a note too. Forgiveness and reconciliation are two different things. Sometimes someone won't receive. We, we want to forgive them, but they won't receive it. That's on them, not you. So sometimes reconciliation is difficult. It's not possible right now, we, but we hope for it. That's the thing. Our heart has to be on that place. You, you have to come really meaning like, I forgive you. Will you forgive me? Can we just reconcile this thing? Otherwise, it doesn't really count. You have to mean it. And sometimes, though, they go, eh, but that doesn't mean it's okay for you to build that. Well, now I got a resentment about that. They wouldn't accept my forgiveness now. He was, no, 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 no. It's, you're, you're doing, you keep doing this. You keep doing this. Stop. Just forgive them. And then if they throw it away, whatever. It's on them. It's hard to do, but it's on them. Sometimes forgiveness has to be done from afar. The person can represent a danger to you or someone you care about. So we have some practical issues here, but it still has to be done. You still have to mean it. And it could be physical or emotional harm. I've had situations where I had to kind of remove people from my life because I was causing them to sin. My presence was causing that person to lie all the time. And I was like, you don't need to lie to me. You can just go lie to yourself. And so it can be like that. Or causing you to sin, not good. But forgive them, love them and forgive them from afar. Send flowers, I don't know. In any event, we must forgive. Reconciliation is always the ideal. That is always what we want. But sometimes it's not possible. So then you get the last step. So you see all that in between there? That's the important stuff. So then it's like, okay, leave, like get out. But you forgive them, hoping they'll come back. I believe this is what happens when we look at 1 Corinthians 5, and then we go to chapter 2. Reconciliation, he's forgiven. So honoring can be done from afar, so can forgiveness. But the forgiveness is absolutely not optional. You must know that. So Jesus, he continues with a parable about forgiveness. He's going to tell a story. <laughs> he likes to do that. So he says there was a king who wanted to settle his accounts. And so he called upon a servant. Give me the money you owe me. Now it says it's a myriad of money, myriad, a lot of money. So it's like some version will say millions of dollars, but it's just, it's a lot of money, right? You just can't imagine how much money this guy owes. And he can't pay it. And so the king's like, well, I'm going to sell you and your whole family to pay off the debt. That's it. So he begs him. And finally, the king has some compassion and he forgives the debt. Great. You know what he does with the forgiveness? He turns right around and finds another servant who owes him money, but it says much less money. But he won't forgive it. He jokes him and he says, give me the money you owe me. Can't pay it. He throws him in prison. He doesn't forget it. Here's what happens. Matthew 18, 31. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man who had been forgiven. And he said, you evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly Father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Jesus' words, not mine. Forgiveness. Now, even if you've not read the Bible a lot, which I'm not saying is a good thing, even if you haven't read the Bible a lot, you probably know some of Jesus' teachings on forgiveness. How many people here could recite the Lord's Prayer? The Our Father. Very, very common, right? So you know that it talks about forgiveness in there. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, right? Or those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You know how it ends? A lot of people say it. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours forever and ever, right? Hmm. 
in our version. And those are really nice words, but what if I told you that wasn't in Jesus' version? He didn't say that. So it's nice. It's true. Here's the power of the glory. Yes, let's, it's a doxology at the end. What if I told you Jesus' version ends really differently? This is what it says in his. So that was verse 13, not the kingdom of glory thing. So if we go back, verses 13, verse 13, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's, that's 13. If we keep reading, so here's the thing, people. We interrupt Jesus. We do that a lot. So he's talking, doesn't stop talking. One continuous flow. Matthew 5 through 7, Jesus talking the whole time. Matthew 6, 14, the very next verse. Remember, he talked about forgiveness. And he says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. Don't stop. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. That's how the Lord's Prayer ends. <laughs> don't like those verses, but I want you to let them soak in today. I know, it's hard. View me as like a personal trainer who's make you doing an extra set. <laughs> All right? We can do that too. <laughs> if you know my story, we can do that. <laughs> All right, so this is the extra, come on, let's go. I'm putting fingers on the bar, come on, spaghetti arms. You can do it. If you, you got to make this, you got to lighten it up, all right? Because otherwise you guys are going to be like, I'm never coming back. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly father will forgive you. Take the cross 15 out. Just cross it out. Don't stop reading. But if you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive your sins. Scare anybody else in the room? Terrifies me. Terrified. This is Jesus talking. Let's just frame this out properly. Not Gene. God. This is God talking. This is Jesus. The, his words. It's not the only place it appears either, by the way. Well, that's just out of context. Nope. No, he means it. He's really serious here. And so we have to take this seriously. These verses have some serious, serious implications. Consequences. So yeah, you know, we put a little doxology at the end of the prayer and we stop and that sounds nice, makes us feel good, but it's not what Jesus is saying here. We've replaced it with something that sounds nicer, but Jesus' words don't always sound nice. It's not the point. I get it, guys. We're probably not going to see these verses on a coffee mug. Imagine them. Can we flip back to them? Can you, can you imagine these on a coffee mug? Like, can we see it on the screen? That, imagine that on a coffee mug. Or just 15. That's it. Imagine that. You're, out, you're just sitting across the table from somebody, and those are on your coffee mug. It's funny. But you know what? Maybe they should be. Right? Maybe we should be starting our day like this. Ah. You know, right? Are we going to stencil? Maybe we should. We should stencil them on the church wall somewhere. You know, people come in. That would really, like, thin out the herd. We'd really, like, separate the Christians from the people who really aren't Christian. I think just do that. We'll stencil them on the wall. That's it. It'll be like, you know, just this. That's it. No one else will come here. You see, we must not preach Christ without consequences. He didn't. Now, here's the encouragement. I get it. I get it. I get it. It's hard. Forgiveness is hard. But I'm going to give you some steps. It'll make it easier. So it's not optional. So what do we do? Step one. Pray. You know what praying is? It's a conversation with God. What does David do? He asks him questions. Where do I go? Hebron, right? So God is speaking. So praying is listening. Praying is listening. You ever have a conversation with someone and they just don't listen? They talk over you and they're not listening to you? That's how most Christians pray. I want God, I want God, I want God, please, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, good, we're done. No! Ask him questions. Why? What's going on? And then go, listen. 
listen. Sometimes you know, it's not like an audible voice, but he'll, he'll send people to speak to you. I've had that happen a lot. The more obedient I am, the more that happens. Where I'll pray about something, someone will walk right up to me and just start saying something. I'm like, you are literally answering the question I just asked. That happens all the time. And the person never knows what they're doing. So God uses things. He uses other people. He uses the radio. He, I mean, he just uses anything. He's God. <laughs> Do whatever he wants. And then sometimes you'll, you'll, you'll hear something or you'll feel something or you'll come to a decision. So listen. Then surrender. You have to surrender and submit. That's how you receive the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit, he's going to make all this much easier. Like, much easier. He's better at this stuff than we are. Can you imagine that? Like God's like actually better at something than we are. You know, so he's going to help you forgive. Surrender all that anger to God. Let him take it. Just say, you deal with that, right? You have enough righteous indignation in the world. Just take that. This will help you to then do some practical things like get the facts. Get rid of the assumptions. If it's a person... Okay, let, let me buy you coffee. And just let the person talk. No but, but just, just let them talk. And then if they're like, I don't want to talk about what you want to talk about. Good, what do you want to talk about? I just, I'm just, I don't even want to talk. I just listen. You tell me all your stuff. That's fine. And you know what? Pastors know this. Got to be patient. Sometimes it's a lot of meetings. <laughs> it's okay. I love you. We'll, we can do this as long as you need to do this. And if you're tired, just ask the Holy Spirit, please give me strength. Start praying. That helps. Ask the questions. What assumptions might you have made? Then here's the big one. Ask God a question. I've done this. It's actually very relieving, but at first kind of painful. God, what is my part in this whole thing? What did I do wrong? Because we always assume that we didn't do anything wrong. What is my part? What, what part, of, where am I wrong in this? And here's the other thing. Stop making perhaps unrealistic expectations. Instead, put yourself in their shoes. Golden rule, Matthew 7, 12, if we kept reading, right, from chapter 5. Treat others the way you want to be treated, but not if you're masochistic. Just Treat others, love others, right? This is the law. It's a remarkable statement. This is the law and the problem. You want, here, this, this, this is what Jesus is saying. This whole thing, love him, love him, love her, love, that's it. That's what Jesus is saying. It is, I've read it in the Greek, it's remarkable. It's very short. This is the law and the prophets. Love other people. Treat them the way you want to be treated. Remarkable. There. There. Summarize it for you. Just love. But it's kind of like the hardest thing to do, isn't it? So pray. And again, it doesn't matter whether that person changes, whether that person accepts, you got to forgive them. And you got to love them. So the story. Was Joab going to kill Abner anyway? Think about it. If presented with the facts, if he knew what was going on, do you think he would have forgave it? Or was he going to kill him anyway? Did he know? He was warned like at least twice. I don't want to kill you, kid. Stop chasing me. I could never face your brother again if I had to kill you. And here's the interesting thing. I think, I think from a martial arts perspective, did it for many, many years, when I look at the scene, I think that this is what happens. Here's the forensics. I'll give you the correct picture. I think. So it says he looked back. He looked back. So he's got a spear, right? And he's an old man like me. And so he's running along, but he's good. Like, so kid, listen, if you fight with me, I'm going to kill you. Don't do it. But he's not. Now it says he's really fast like a gazelle. Why would he hit him with the butt end of the spear? If you really wanted to kill someone, you turn around, stab him. Probably he wants to knock the wind out of him. It's a great martial arts technique. Bop, right in the stomach. And then the person doubles over <gasps> like that, right? And then you just walk away. Don't do that to anyone this week. Anyway, just... <laughs> so he's going fast, but here's the thing. He's going like a gazelle. So bop, he runs into the spear and it goes through him. I believe he did not want to kill him. Two warnings. 
and the butt end of the spear. He didn't want to do it. But do you think if Joab knew that, do you think he'd change his mind? I don't know. You see, Abner presented a threat to Joab. He could be David's new general. You see, sometimes we don't forgive because we have a motive. And we have to find out what that might be if we're not forgiving. That's something else we need to ask ourselves. We come up with lots of reasons, but they're only excuses. Jesus isn't going to accept them. Do you think Abner was looking for an excuse to leave Ishbosheth? Pretty quick, right? I'm out. You make an accusation, I'm done. Do we do that too? We're looking for an excuse to not forgive. But Abner, for all his faults too, he gives us a key verse I want to share with you before we close. 2 Samuel 2, 26. Abner shouted down to Joab, so after Asahel's been killed, must we always be killing each other? Don't you realize that bitterness is the only result? Don't you realize that bitterness is the only result? So in this story, as it frames out, don't you realize that bitterness is the only result? We've been talking about church being a place of peace and taking that peace with you throughout the week and extending it to others. So let's do that. But on the topic of peace, let me add something. Inner peace. Forgiveness is freeing. Forgiveness is freeing. I want that inner peace for you. Don't let it rot within you. And there's something else I want everybody to hear. I know a lot of you need to hear this. Sometimes you're not forgiving others because you haven't forgiven yourself. You want peace? Forgive yourself. God already forgave you. Who are you to hold on to it? Forgive yourself. It's okay. Move on. You cannot do anything about the past, but you can do something about the future. Forgive yourself. Forgive others. It's freeing. We only ruin our lives when we let those resentments rot within us. Let's remember the grace and mercy that God has poured out over all of us and extend it to those for whom Jesus died. Amen? Let me pray for you from the scriptures. Lord, fill us with your spirit and help us to get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, help us to be kind to each other, tender-hearted forgiving one another, just as God through Christ Jesus has forgiven us. Amen.